You may also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your question then. Now to our speaker. Dr. Angela Britson is a board certified cardiologist who joined Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians in 2018. Dr. Britson received her undergraduate degree from Indiana University in Biological Sciences and then obtained her PhD in Cardiovascular Pharmacology at the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Britson then graduated from medical school at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine completed her residency at University Hospital in Cincinnati and her fellowship in cardiology at Ross Hart Hospital at The Ohio State University. Dr. Britson did an additional fellowship in heart failure heart transplant at Ross Hart Hospital. She is board certified in advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology. Welcome Dr. Britson. Thank you. <laughs> so I am going to go ahead and turn my camera off so I can operate this computer. I'm not the most computer savvy person, so bear with me. Um, so what we're going to be doing is hopefully um, providing a lot of information to you so that um, dealing with systolic heart failure um, becomes uh, fun and not um, a headache. So we're going to start off with uh, my objectives. And okay. So um, I'm going to go over some introductory stuff first with heart failure in general, just to um, establish why it is so important in trying to um, identify, treat, and um, manage these patients. I think that's done across the board from many different specialties. That's not only a cardiology thing, that's primary care. It involves um, many different um, teamwork efforts. So looking at the epidemiology as well as the uh, mortality of heart failure, um, establishing a definition and um, going through the pathophysiology because that sort of identifies how we go forth and treat and try and improve outcomes for these patients. Um, review the classification of heart failure and why it's important to include this um, in notes and um, documentation um, when caring for these patients and then getting to the tools of treating systolic heart failure and markers for advanced systolic heart failure. So, heart failure is obviously a very um, expansive diagnosis and disease. Uh, 6.5 million U.S. adults are diagnosed with heart failure. The prevalence is something that we see that increases with age. Uh, currently, you can um, be sure that there's about a million cases that are diagnosed each year, and it's usually occurring in an age group of 55 or older. The numbers that um, uh, these reflect is why it's so much is we have an aging population. Um, there's been improved survival from uh, patients that have had um, heart attacks and other types of cardiovascular disease, and the prevalence of a lot of the risk factors such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, which play into the disease progression as well. So one of the things I like to emphasize with survival of heart failure is actually heart failure is um, more deadly than a lot of cancers, either in men or women. So we say it's more malignant than cancer. The only cancer heart failure does not beat out is lung cancer. So um, not only is heart failure more malignant than cancer, but there is no cure. We have a lot of therapies that can improve a patient's um, uh, ejection fraction or symptoms, but we cannot cure it. So definition of heart failure, it's obviously a syndrome of congestion that results from structural or functional impairment of the heart with its filling or ejection of blood. There are different types of heart failure. Um, we have systolic heart failure, which is otherwise known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. 
that is identified with an ejection fraction less than 40, equal to or less than 40%. The other is diastolic heart failure that has a preserved ejection fraction, otherwise known as HEFPEF. And that ejection fraction is <clears throat> defined as equal to or greater than 50%. So there is a gray area that has had um, now been um, defined as heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Um, in this um, diagram, it's heart failure with borderline EF is what the B stands for, but that ejection fraction is what it's hard to tell what do you identify the patient with. So that EF is 41 to 49 percent. And with the recent guidelines that have come out actually this month, there are specific therapies or medications that are recommended now um, for that um, group of individuals. But I'm going to be focusing on HEFREF, which is the systolic heart failure, less than 40%. One of the things I wanted to um, emphasize is just that there's pretty much equal in the population of reduced and um, preserved ejection fraction. So mortality of heart failure um, is something that um, I think we we see, but we don't grasp actually um, taking care of these patients in the inpatient setting. One of the things I want to emphasize is that with every hospitalization, the mortality increases. So what you see here is that a median survival for a patient um, hospitalized with heart failure, doesn't matter which type, their median survival is estimated just around two and a half years. And after the first hospitalization, you get a significant decline thereafter, looking at less than 1.5 year survival um, after the second one. So if you see a patient within one year that's been hospitalized four times, less than a year is what is estimated for their median survival. So that's quite deadly. The other um, important thing with uh, the five-year mortality that we see after hospitalization is that it's not different on whether you have preserved, reduced, or mildly um, reduced uh, ejection fraction. And at five years, that mortality achieves 75%. So the patients that you are managing that have um, been hospitalized 75% of them will die in five years. So some of the things that cause the um, progression of heart failure over time, um, and it is initially um, started with an index event. And what is that index event? It can be something acute, it can be something subacute, or it can be chronic. So an acute presentation would be your uh, myocardial infarction. It could be something like acute myocarditis, um, maybe even um, an acute onset of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Um, Subacute is sort of like a lot of the diseases that um, contribute to a lot of cardiovascular disease and can result in cardiomyopathy. And so hypertension, diabetes, valvular disease are amongst those. Um, we uh, also have a little bit rare um, types of cardiomyopathy that we see that is in pregnant um, women. There's a familial cardiomyopathy and all of those that I'm trying to emphasize in this is that you start with the initial um, disruption of the um, contractility and that will cause a set of changes that will result in compensatory mechanisms that are meant to create homeostasis within the heart. So that decreased cardiac pumping capacity um, is the first initial um, insult to the heart, and it starts to um, be detected by baroreceptors in the heart, um, in the aortic arch, in the carotid, that basically sense the underfilling or circulatory changes that arise. So what happens is the, um, usually you have a, a predominance of the um, vagal or parasympathetic nervous system input 
and um, into the heart. And with these baroreceptors sensing the underfilling, you have loss of the inhibitory input from them going into the autonomic nervous system. And that results in excessive sympathetic nervous system output. So um, increased norepinephrine and epinephrine are um, released and these effects result in various changes at the level of the heart, the kidneys and the peripheral vascular or peripheral um, uh, vasculature. Uh, activation of um, these compensatory mechanisms lead to changes in uh, those end organ uh, systems. So increased sympathetic drive is going to end up having um, an increase in uh, um, beta agonist activity within the heart, increasing heart rate, contractility. Um, in the short term, that seems like that would be a good thing, but this increased um, adrenergic drive in the long term re results in a lot of changes within the heart and the body. Within the kidneys, you get changes with increased sodium absorption and, um, and water retention. In the vasculature, you get increased vasoconstriction. And all of these are sort of like the phenotype that you're seeing in a decompensated um, patient coming into the hospital. Over time, with these um, various um, changes in hemodynamic overload, you have either a pressure overload that can occur at the heart over time or a volume overload that brings on a lot of extracellular and intracellular signaling um, transduction. And what that results in is remodeling, fibrosis, dysfunction in the heart, how well it's able to work as a pump. Um, you can get increased thickness of the um, ventricular wall where you get concentric hypertrophy. Um, or you get the opposite of e um, eccentric hypertrophy where the heart becomes more dilated, the walls become thin. And uh, these are the remodeling changes that over time will um, have a person have a transition from being asymptomatic to symptomatic. And, um, and that's when we are able to identify them and say that they have um, a heart failure episode. So overall, these neurohormonal mechanisms start off with an index event that brings on increased sympathetic nervous system activity, um, increased activity from the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, increases in other kinds of neurohormones such as endothelin, you have some of the um, counter-regulatory um, peptides such as AMP and BMP that are trying to offset the increased sympathetic and um, renin angiotensin um, activity. And this results in end organ damage. So the LV remodeling, increased hypertrophy, fibrosis, cell loss, oxidative um, abnormalities, and um, arrhythmias. Um, in the endothelium, you have a lot of the uh, nitric oxide or endothelial dysfunction, vasoconstriction, and all of these are what continue to spiral down in the whole syndrome of congestive heart failure. So um, within the sympathetic nervous system increased um, output, you get um, changes at the level of the end organs, the heart, the kidneys, and the vasculature. And I sort of probably am uh, repeating myself a little bit with this, but basically from the heart standpoint, you have um, loss of um, cells that, that result in fibrosis um, and you have um, changes in the beta receptor responsiveness, you have arrhythmias that can occur as well as impairment and how well the heart fills and ejects blood. In the kidney, you have um, changes that occur with how is it handling sodium and fluid for the body, and that's resulting from the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, you <clears throat> will also have a decreased response to na uh, natriuretic peptides, so the counter-regulatory um, peptides that try to maintain balance or homeostasis are less effective, resulting in that volume um, increase. And finally, in the peripheral uh, vasculature, you have a lot of vasoconstriction and endothelial dysfunction. 
With the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, a lot of this is triggered with the increase in renin that is secreted um, with the increased sympathetic drive from the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Renin is very involved because it basically transitions angiotensinogen over to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted um, by the angiotensin converting enzyme to angiotensin 2, which is the active component that does a lot of these changes um, that I was uh, reviewing that affect the sodium and water retention as well as other types of sympathetic activity um, in the in the in the body. So um, angiotensinogen, uh, I'm sorry, angiotensin 2 can actually enhance sympathetic nervous um, system output. It affects how um, the kidney will um, retain sodium and fluid or water. It can uh, stimulate the production of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex, which also has that impact on the kidney for uh, the retention of sodium and water. It um, causes vasoconstriction in the, uh, in the vessels, and then it can also institute a thirst um, uh, center in the posterior pituitary gland, enhancing ADH secretion and obviously affecting free water in the collecting um, duct of the kidney. So I referred to the counter regulatory peptides. They basically are trying to balance out um, what is going on with renin, angiotensin, <clears throat> and aldosterone system, as well as the sympathetic nervous system drive. And so the ones that we sort of focus on because of a lot of the targets that we use in heart failure to treat um, congestion is the natriuretic peptides. And so those have um, an effect of causing the reverse of what norepinephrine, epinephrine, and angiotensin 2 have on the body, and that is vasodilation. They decrease blood pressure. They decrease sympathetic tone. They increase the loss of sodium um, in the urine and loss of um, water, and they decrease some of the other neurohormonal levels, such as aldosterone, vasopressin and result in remodeling or decreased fibrosis and hypertrophy. So these nat natriuretic peptides, if you look at this, is trying to balance the pathophysiological response of the renin angiotensin uh, system and sympathetic system, but that balance is, it's, it's actually an imbalance because they have less of an effect. Um, these natriuretic peptides, ANP, BNP, that um, are actually produced by the walls of the heart when it's distended, is a way for the heart to signal to the kidneys that the, the heart is full and, um, and is requesting the kidneys to get rid of the salt and the fluid. The problem is, is those are only out and um, active for a certain period of time because they are degraded by an enzyme called neprilysin. And um, neprilysin ends up being one of the targets of um, one of the um, more favored heart failure medications in Tresto, and we'll go over that in just a moment. The um, uh, nat natriuretic peptides basically um, are going through a signaling uh, mechanism that increases through guanylate cyclase, cyclic GMP. That's how you're getting your naturesis. Inhibition of sympathetic and renin angiotensin system, vasodilation. And here, as you see over here, the uh, neprilysin is um, basically a group of uh, neutral endopeptidases that degrade these um, peptides. Now I'm going to transition real quick before we get into the tools of how you treat uh, systolic heart failure is the classification of heart failure. And um, one of the things uh, I think is easy to understand with this is this is a staging system that you cannot go back and forth in. It's like if you stage cancer. Um, uh, you cannot um, become um, less advanced stage of cancer um, when they are trying to figure out therapeutic treatments and goals of therapy. So um, staging of um, heart failure is different than the New York heart functional classes of heart failure. 
uh, and we'll go over those in just a moment too. So these are the ACC AHA stages, which have recently been renamed a little bit so that um, um, uh, they're more applicable. And this is sort of what we want to use in our documentation. So we're able to figure out um, how to best go about treating these patients. So we're going to start off with stage A. And these are people that have no abnormalities structurally or functionally with the heart. They are at increased risk. Um, these risk factors can be high blood pressure, diabetes. They may have a high risk or actual cardiovascular disease. Maybe they're getting chemotherapy for um, breast cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, or they're the relative of someone in the family that has um, a known inherited cardiomyopathy. What recently was added to the guidelines um, is we actually can include patients if we are concerned, we can screen them by looking at their BMP or their NT pro BMP levels. And if those are increased, that also puts them in a stage A, meaning they are at risk of having or developing heart failure. The goals of treating um, someone in stage A is to optimize those lifestyles, um, try and um, uh, get good blood pressure control, prevent um, disease such as um, uh, assessing their lipids and uh, um, going forth with prevention of vascular and cardiovascular um, disease. Um, and obviously trying to prevent any kind of structural abnormalities. So a lot of things that I would emphasize is um, routinely looked at and tried to optimize in the primary care physician's office. Um, so being able to identify what patients you would think would be potentially stage A or are stage A. The next stage is basically stage B, which is considered pre-heart failure. So these are actually patients that are asymptomatic. They have no um, shortness of breath, fatigue, chest discomfort, or anything like that um, that um, can be associated with um, congestive heart failure, but they have the structural abnormality. So they can um, have um, increased wall thickness, dilated heart, reduced function, um, maybe regional wall motion abnormalities, but they have literally no symptoms. So um, they have already started some of the remodeling. I would say when we were looking at the pathophysiology of um, the progression of disease, they um, have already started down that compensatory path. However, they don't have symptoms. So our goals are to prevent heart failure symptoms from occurring. So this is when we start bringing on medications such as beta blockers and um, um, angiotensin receptor blockers, um, as well as ACE inhibitors, um, as we see in the guidelines. And we want to prevent any further cardiac remodeling. So we're still trying to achieve all of the things that we're trying to achieve for anyone in stage A. So it's obviously a progression from A to B. Once you have structural abnormalities, you can never go from B to A. The next stage is stage C, which is symptomatic heart failure. So that means you have been symptomatic at some point in your life. So maybe you had shortness of breath, you got put on medications, um, you have structural abnormalities, and you now are asymptomatic because you've been treated well with your therapy. Even though you're asymptomatic now, you were symptomatic at one point. So you are still in stage C heart failure. You can never say that you went to B. You went from B to C, so you can only go forward. So the goals of treating symptomatic heart failure is what we're gonna be focusing today. Um, that's controlling symptoms, providing education to adjust lifestyle. We want to improve um, uh, treatment so that we can decrease the progression of heart failure over time, prevent hospitalization, and prevent, prevent mortality. And finally, the last stage is stage D, and this is basically advanced heart failure that no longer is responding to any of the therapies that were recommended to optimize the patient in stage C heart failure. Um, these are patients that are um, very, very symptomatic, can barely do their activities of daily living, 
uh, have resting symptoms. And the goals for therapy in this um, patient is to try and improve their quality of life, control their symptoms, um, reduce hospitalizations, and that is not because we're improving their um, survivability. It's realizing that um, they are slowly dying. They have, um, they want to establish what are their end of life goals and recognize um, how the heart failure um, is, recognize that they have end stage heart failure. Now, the New York Heart Association functional class is different. This is where we describe what are you able to do. So this is all um, being used to describe both stage C and stage D heart failure. These are your symptomatic heart failure stages. So you can go from stage one up to stage four, back to stage two, up to stage three, back to stage one. You can go back and forth based on um, how well uh, your symptoms are controlled and your disease is controlled. So New York Heart Class 1 is um, asymptomatic, able to do a fair amount of activity and not be um, limited. New York Heart um, Class 2 is you're able to do moderate levels of activity with mild symptoms. New York Heart Class 3, you're able to do your activities of daily living or mild activity, but you, you do develop moderate um, limiting symptoms with that. And New York Heart Class 4, you have um, symptoms whether you're at rest or you're active, so you're extremely limited. So now, how do we go about treating heart failure? What are the things that we can do to improve um, morbidity, mortality, and maybe even um, improve how um, the function of the heart? So this is what I call my heart failure toolbox. I have four drawers that um, I use, um, um, probably three drawers I use most of the time, but sometimes I have to use the fourth drawer. Um, these are dealing with lifestyle, medications, device therapies and device the third drawer has a little bit of a hodgepodge of some other stuff too that's not just devices and then the fourth drawer is what i pull out when i'm having to deal with the advanced heart failure um, options on the right i have this is probably not an updated um, uh, slide that we can use now with a lot of the changes however i think it sort of demonstrates to you this um increasing um, going up on therapies that are required as the stages of heart failure become more advanced. So we start off with risk factor and education and try and identify people that we can prevent disease in as we identify um, abnormalities with or without symptoms and, um, and add on medical therapies to try and improve the quality of life and reduce the morbidity and mortality in these patients over time. So going first into the first drawer is lifestyle. So what we're recommending is that they change um, lifestyle so that we can limit the amount of um, uh, stressors on the heart based on what they eat. So um, doing a sodium restriction um, of two to three grams per day um, that would also include a fluid restriction that we um, recommend that I don't have up here that would be 64 ounces of fluid per day. So if we're able to limit the amount of sodium and fluid that um, the patient is consuming, that will hopefully limit the amount of sodium and fluid that the renin angiotensin aldosterone system can act on and cause them to become fluid overloaded. <clears throat> we want to um, optimize their blood pressure control cholesterol, especially for cardiovascular disease, blood sugar for diabetes, try and um, encourage smoking cessation, avoid um, excessive alcohol intake or polysubstance abuse, which is toxic to the heart, encourage weight loss, exercise training, and then um, in patients that do have heart failure, cardiac rehab is very, very helpful in um, improving their cardiovascular conditioning and um, how their heart failure um, uh, is managed. 
As I indicated before, weight loss, bariatric surgery is definitely something that can really help out because being obese can cause a lot of heart failure symptomatology and, um, and progression. Evaluating for sleep disordered breathing is very important. Sleep apnea does not cause um, heart failure, but can make heart failure uh, um, more decompensated just because of some of the catecholamine um, uh, abnormalities that occur due to the sleep apnea being untreated. Um, depression, screening for and treating depression is very important because depression leads to inability to be compliant with medications and doing the things that we are highly recommending. Um, and so um, having um, patients seen um, by their primary care, their psychiatrist or their psychologist to help out is very important um, no matter what stage of disease um, or heart failure that they're in. So now we're going to go to um, a bigger drawer, which is medical therapy. And um, the medical therapy is specifically targeted towards systolic heart failure or um, half -RAF. Um, There are guideline directed medical therapies that we try to get patients on, which include actually four different um, uh, types of therapy now, which has changed. The new um, uh, kit on the block is the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors or SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, in addition to what we have been trying to um, uh, up titrate and get patients on, which include beta blockade, renin angiotensin uh, system inhibition, as well as the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. So all of these, if you remember my uh, pathophysiology, are targeting a lot of the abnormalities that occur when compensatory mechanisms um, ensue because of that index event that started the cardiac dysfunction. <clears throat> Hydralazine and isardil, otherwise known as bidil, is um, indicated um, in um, patients that we'll go over as well and is helpful and can actually reduce um, cardiovascular mor morbidity and mortality. Um, diuretics improve symptoms, but they don't make people live longer uh, or um, um, live longer or live better. Um, they basically are just a Band-Aid. So I really try to optimize volume status with these, but I do not, I also try to tr um, wean them off and have the patient have a lifestyle that will accommodate less diuretics. Additional therapies, once guideline medical um, treatment has been optimized, can include digoxin, Corlinor, Verquovo, and some um, potassium binders. So we'll start off with um, the guideline directed medical therapies and beta blockers, um, which uh, I have indicated uh, from the previous slides on pathophysiology are very helpful in blocking that sympathetic nervous system excess. So um, beta-1 receptors are the ones that are more prevalent in the heart that we are blocking. We have um, three different beta blockers. One, some are non-selective and some are selective. They will decrease heart rate. They will have a negative inotropic effect and they can also have some, affection, have some effects to conduction in the AV node. <clears throat> in the uh, vasculature, they, um, uh, especially if we're using um, a non-selective beta blocker, we can get a little bit of vasodilation because there is um, alpha-1 blockade with this. And then dealing with the kidneys, blocking the beta-1 receptors in the juxtaglomerular um, apparatus decreases the release of renin, which will enhance the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So all of these cardiovascular benefits um, uh, really are blocking the neurohormonal stimulation so that we can allow for remodeling in a positive way and not a detrimental way for the patient. Um, we're decreasing blood pressure, myocardial oxygen demand, sodium and fluid retention, and, um, and trying to 
uh, decrease the hypertrophy and fibrosis that's occurring so we can have a positive cardiovascular remodeling. The three beta blockers that are utilized and have been shown to improve um, uh, cardiac uh, or heart failure include metoprolol succinate, and that's succinate and not tartrate. Succinate is the long acting beta blocker. We do try to go to the highest doses. It's not just getting a beta blocker on board for these patients. We start low and we go high. That can take six, nine months, maybe even 12 months, depending on what the patient's blood pressures allow and heart rates allow. So metoprolol succinate, we will try to go to 150 milligrams. Um, and that can be uh, uh, up to twice a day. Uh, Bisoprolol, um, 10 milligrams daily is one of the maximal doses, and Carvedilol is up to 25 milligrams twice a day. Um, both Metoprolol and Bisoprolol are selective beta ones. Carvedilol is the non-selective with the alpha one um, blocker included in it. The next um, medical therapy that we're trying to target and block is the effects of the renin angiotensin system. Here, um, as I had indicated before, you have an increased amount of renin that um, changes into angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Um, angiotensin 1 is then cleaved by the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor to angiotensin 2. So ACE inhibitors are targeting this enzyme so that we can decrease the amount of angiotensin 2 that is produced. Angiotensin 2 receptor blockers also work similarly by decreasing the effects, not the levels, but the effects of angiotensin 2, and that's working on the AT1 receptors. Uh, those receptors tend to um, promote vasoconstriction when angiotensin 2 is bound to them. They also can cause cell growth, aldosterone secretion, and catecholamine release. So um, these um, uh, um, effects result in um, not allowing the um, detrimental effects of angiotensin <clears throat> on the body. Now, the um, new kid on the block, block is um, Entresto, and it has sort of come to the forefront because of its unique dual type of blockade. So it has in it valsartan as well as secubitril. Valsartan is your angiotensin um, receptor blocker. Secubitril is, um, the is the medication that actually blocks the enzyme that I was talking about beforehand called neprilysin. Neprilysin is what cleaves or inactivates BNP. And so by um, inhibiting neprilysin, we're allowing BNP to stay around longer. And therefore, we're enhancing the counter regulatory peptides effect, which is going to promote naturesis. It's going to decrease renin. You get vasodilation, so you don't have increased vasoconstriction occurring in the vessels. You um, can also enhance endothelial function. You decrease the effects of remodeling with hypertrophy and fibrosis, and you decrease sympathetic outflow. You're also inhibiting the effects of angiotensin II um, that's affecting some of these same you know, effects via the AT1 receptor. And so what has been demonstrated when compared to an ACE inhibitor, which had been beforehand one of the guy, um, level one indications, um, is that Entresto actually had better outcomes. And so we try to utilize um, this medication um, first and foremost, but there are some things that we have to be aware of, and that is the side effects that can occur with um, Entresto. Specifically, they had previously coupled Secubitril with an ACE inhibitor, uh, and that had resulted in this black box warning of angioedema. 
and so that was the reason why that could not be marketed. So really profound, um, like my father said when he had this, is Homer Simpson lips. So um, what is going on is neprilysin is inhibited, and therefore you have the um, reduction in degrading of other peptides such as bradykinin that's involved in this. The ACE inhibitor is um, affecting, um, obviously, angiotensin converting enzyme, which together can really increase the bradykinin and cause this kind of an effect. So therefore, when transitioning patients from, who have been on an ACE inhibitor to Entresto, there has to be a 36 hour washout pe period. So I usually he heavily recommend that you just stop it for 48 hours. It's one of the other reasons why I think it's very important now, since um, you'll see with the guidelines, it is now a level 1A recommendation where it was not in the previous years to actually start in Trusto. Beforehand, it was recommended to do an ACE inhibitor and then um, maybe an ARB. But now anyone New York Heart class two or three with a reduced ejection fraction, um, less than 40%, equal to or less than 40% may, um, uh, it's recommended to start uh, in Tresto. But if they were already on, let's say, an ACE inhibitor, um, then you need to hold that for um, 36 hours. The other um, thing that I think is interesting with the guidelines now is um, if there is something why financial ability to pay for, um, you know, the medication for Entresto, um, an ACE inhibitor is considered reasonable to use. And the same thing with using an ARB in case a patient is intolerant to ACE inhibitor. Um, a level 1B recommendation that comes in though, and this is actually what I thought I was gonna talk about before, so it sounded like I was uh, um, interested in this one indication and I wasn't. So the level B, 1B recommendation is actually to replace an ACE inhibitor or an ARB with Entresto in a patient who is chronic um, with, ha basically has a chronic symptomatic um, systolic heart failure, class two or class three. So beforehand it was okay to keep them on it, but there has been so much um, improvement with Entresto versus these others that it has been recommended that you actually replace their ACE or ARB if you can um, and uh, replace it with the Entresto. Another thing I'd like to say about um, the Entresto is that we commonly need to monitor um, if anyone has uh, any renal insufficiency or um, blood pressure issues or um, potassium um, we're monitoring those labs within seven to 10 days after starting an ACE, an ARB, or an ARNI, or with any changes in dose because of the potential of abnormalities with the kidneys or obviously with the blood pressure. Um, going on to mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, this is um, uh, including spironolactone or aldactone. This basically works at the level of the collecting um, duct and um, um, it involves this sodium potassium um, transporter and basically you are um, inhibiting um, the effect of um, aldosterone binding to its receptor and you're enhancing um, it's a potassium sparing um, effect aldosterone has a significant amount of um, um, effect on fibrosis, as well as hypertrophy. And by blocking this, you can block the development of fibrosis over time. So um, this is the third agent. We usually just go with spironolactone unless they develop an adverse effect such as gynecomastia. And then we switch them over to a plerinone because it has um, less of an effect for patients, especially um, men, to develop gynecomastia, which is very tender. Um, tenderness in their 
um, in their nipples. So um, the things to monitor for for um, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist is life threatening hyperkalemia. So patients that tend um, to hold on to potassium um, or uh, have kidney dysfunction, we need to make sure um, that the um, we're monitoring those labs. In our um, office, we do these quarterly, even if they're on a stable dose. Um, it's important to make sure that you do not start these medications in anyone with a GFR less than 30 and avoid if their potassium is, is um, climbing close to five. The SGLT2 inhibitors are the new kids on the block and they basically is a sodium um, glucose trans co-transporter. Um, there is um, one and two, two different types. The SGLT2 is um, predominantly found in the um, proximal tubule. And what it does, um, and what I'm going to explain here is you have a normal um, looking uh, kidney. Here is one that's um, with heart failure and here's one with an SGLT2 inhibitor on board. So basically it's affecting the um, uh, tone of the afferent arterial because um, it is impacting um, the, the co-transport of both sodium and um, glucose. So by um, um, inhibiting the co-transport of this, you're increasing the amount of uh, glucose and sodium and water that get um, eliminated. And more sodium is being um, uh, presented to um, the macula densa, and that results in um, a normalization of um, blood flow and um, and can be somewhat of a renal protect, um, protective effect. Um, these inhibitors have demonstrated significant um, uh, improvement in patients with diabetes or without diabetes and heart failure. Um, it's one of the reasons why it's been added on to the guidelines. Uh, we have seen decreased hospitalizations as well as decrease in cardiovascular mortality. And it was just recently added on as the fourth one, why we're calling it quad therapy for guideline directed medical therapy. Um, Jardians and Farsiga are the two SGLT2 inhibitors that have been recommended. Um, you need to be careful um, in, in using these agents, especially with generalized infections. Um, there is concern of continuing them if there's any kind of um, uh, urinary tract infections, yeast infections, soft tissue infections, and um, as well as some of, uh, there's a potential for ketoacidosis, but this is very rare. Uh, one of the things, because it um, brings through so much sodium and uh, glucose in the urine, you may need to adjust the uh, diuretic dose uh, in order to prevent volume depletion. So um, diuretics are also utilized. Um, I'm gonna go through these pretty fast. Um, the loop diuretics are the most potent and help out with volume uh, management in patients. They work at the loop of Henley. Um, we have thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. Usually the hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothaladone are used in patients that are um, have very mild volume overload. Um, so they're not very potent but the metolazone and the chlorothiazide, these can be, um, uh, patient, uh, can be used in patients that are more refractory and, and basically synergize or increase the amount of diuresis we can uh, try and achieve um, who are extremely fluid overloaded and anasarchic. I usually tend to use the loop diuretics like torsamide or Bumex because furosemide over time becomes um, somewhat ineffective for a lot of patients. So just changing them from furosemide over to torsemide can create a significant improvement in the management of their volume. As I stated before, the volume status is um, the only thing we're um, targeting. It, this does not improve any kind of outcome such as in morbidity or mortality. Hydralazine is um, a combination of isosorbide and hydralazine is uh, a vasodilator 
the mechanism of action isn't entirely known, but it does have effect on um, nitric oxide signaling. It is our only one that is sort of a race-based medical therapy because it's been heavily recommended to be used in African-Americans based on the HF trial. Um, this is only to be added on after guideline-directed medical therapy has been optimized, but these patients do it very well um, once we've added hydralazine and isardil um, to their regimen, and, um, and it does show improvement in um, morbidity and mortality. We can also utilize these agents in patients that have um, intolerance to ACE inhibitor, ARB, ARNI, or aldosterone antagonists. And that is drug intolerance, acute renal insufficiency, or hyperkalemia. Additional therapies. Um, I'm going to go, because I think we're running out of time, I'm going to go past digoxin quickly. It's been an old medication, but the thing is, I rarely will use it, but in small, um, in isolated um, times, it may be effective more so in a young patient that is very um, advanced. I usually like to try and avoid using it in the elderly because it's renally metabolized and has a narrow therapeutic index. It's pretty much considered almost like an oral inotrope, but it's not um, equivalent of what your dobutamine or your milrinone would be. Corlinor is a uh, medication that we will add on, which is basically um, a medication that targets the cardiac pacemaker. It's called the funny current. It will block this um, pacemaker, and basically what you see in this um, diagram, it slows the depolarization, so it decreases the heart rate. It doesn't have any effect in AV nodal blocky, um, blockade. Um, these patients um, that I use it in are the ones that have a heart rate greater than 70 on maximal beta blockade. They have to be in sinus rhythm. Atrial fibrillation does not work with this because of how it uh, works on the cardiac pacemaker. Ejection fraction has to be less than 35% and they need to be symptomatic. It can be a deal breaker for some who have heart rates in the 90s and still are on maximal um, beta blockade. They will start to feel better once you use the Corlinor. I don't use it often. <clears throat> Something more recent and new is Verquovo. It's a guanylate cyclase inhib um, I'm sorry, stimulator. It basically is um, working on um, enhancing guanylate cyclase in the cell to nitric oxide. This will um, allow for um, enhanced cyclic GMP levels, which result in vasodilation um, and uh, improved myocardial dysfunction. It is used in patients that have symptomatic heart failure, class two to four. The ejection fraction needs to be less than 45% and they need to have had a recent hospitalization or an ER visit or in the clinic requiring IV Lasix. The, um, this medication is not to be used prior to maximizing guideline-directed medical therapy, but can be used in the midst of up titrating it to decrease their symptoms. It's been shown to improve quality of life um, and reduce hot heart failure hospitalizations. Drugs to avoid um, the uh, diltiazem and verapamil are non um, dihydropyridamine um, calcium channel blockers. Um, these usually increase the risk of recurrent heart failure, and we try to avoid these if we can. Um, flecainide or 1C antiarrhythmics increase mortality. Dronetarone is something very significant mortality in congestive heart failure. Um, amiodarone is fine, just that um, dronetarone or Multac is the one that's high uh, mortality. Um, TZDs um, tend to increase fluid retention and um, hospitalization, so we get these off the medication list. Um, uh, Sexagliptin um, has also been noted with increased risk of heart failure, hospitalization, and obviously NSAIDs. So um, device therapies, 
It has been demonstrated for primary prevention that ICDs can um, decrease total mortality. We try to avoid using these until guideline directed medical therapies have been instituted. We will wait for three months before we um, check an echocardiogram in someone who has a non ischemic cardiomyopathy um, before considering this because if their EF has improved greater than 35%, there's no need for the ICD, and we want to really try and remodel and improve the heart. If someone's had an ischemic cardiomyopathy, um, we need to wait 40 days before we're considering this kind of therapy. Obviously, secondary prevention of sudden cardiac death is um, uh, needed for an ICD in order to um, decrease mortality. Patients with left bundle branch block um, can significantly um, improve their um, quality of life and, and symptoms with CRT or synchronization therapy where we are pacing the left and right ventricles together. Just that inefficient contractility where the left and right are not um, synchronized uh, can result in significant symptoms for some patients. Um, it doesn't mean that it works in all, but it definitely is something that we pursue if patients still remain quite symptomatic once their guideline-directed medical therapies have been optimized. It has been demonstrated not only to improve symptoms, but decrease mortality and hospitalizations and recover hearts. Um, there is a remote monitoring device that's like a walking swan called CardioMEMS. Um, this is a, a device that can help us keep patients out of the hospital. It um, will also improve their quality of life if they're not constantly hospitalized. It is the size of a paper clip. It gets plant implanted into the left pulmonary artery. This is done um, with uh, a, like a right heart cath type of an approach. Um, the patient will, after the device has been implanted, will lay on a pillow, which basically gets um, the pulmonary artery pressures from this device and sends it via a secure network to our office um, remotely. And we get this information on a daily basis from the patient and are able to adjust diuretics and other therapies to decrease pulmonary artery pressures and decrease congestion. Um, the, uh, this has been shown to significantly help out um, all types of heart failure. So we're dealing not only HEF-REF, but HEF-PEF. Um, the reason why it works so well is that it, we are actually seeing the pressures in the um, pulmonary artery, and we see these much sooner than we do when we see changes in weight or the patient actually starts feeling short of breath. So we can adjust their medical therapy based on the numbers we're getting remotely on the device and decrease any congestion that will evolve into symptoms and therefore we can decrease hospitalizations. Um, indications for a CardioMEMS device is um, obviously having symptomatic heart failure, so New York Heart Class 2 or 3. It doesn't matter what your ejection fraction is. Previously, you had to be hospitalized within the year to be considered a candidate for this, but they have changed it to mean that you can get a BNP, and if they have an elevated BNP, they could also be considered. So the um, it's widened as far as candidacy for the device. I'm going to go through this break. I want to get to advanced heart failure therapies. So the last um, drawer is really dealing with patients who um, over time have um, developed advanced end stage um, heart failure. And what this um, diagram shows is time is coming down here on this axis and on the side we have their quality of life or their physical function symptomatology. So they're first diagnosed here in A their heart um, is not working well, they're more symptomatic, and we start to institute all of the guideline-directed medical therapy, device therapy, lifestyle, and a lot of times we're able to improve these patients with their um, symptoms, and they, um, they increase to where we see B, and they sit and go along during time for a certain period of time before they start having um, what I say is progression of their heart failure. That's when they start having decompensation. 
um, of heart failure and have hospitalizations where you see these dips and um, and they get hospitalized and we diurese them and we bring them back. But you know what? We don't bring them all the way back. We just get them a little bit better. And as this becomes more frequent, which I call the roller coaster, this is where heart failure is progressing and we are not able to cure heart failure. And so being able to identify these patients before they be um, start hitting the really um, uh, frequent hospitalizations is ideal so that we can consider them for advanced heart failure therapies. <clears throat> the recognizing of this stage of advanced heart failure is very important because number one, the survival at this point is short. We don't have time to optimize and um, and provide them with therapies, especially if we're finding them at a very late end stage kind of um, uh, disease. Um, they become uh, their quality of life becomes horrific and um, the treatments become more limited. The um, more progress the disease, the the the, the progressive the disease, the less the treatments um, available. Um, I show these two pictures because which patient has advanced heart failure? Both of them do. The patient that we miss is the one that doesn't have all the signs of extreme advanced end stage, but would potentially benefit if he's demonstrating markers of advanced heart failure for something like transplant or a left ventricular cyst device. We start thinking it, about it with this gentleman who has um, obvious ascites. He probably has a port in place for inotropic therapy. He's cachectic, he's lost muscle mass. He obviously has had a previous, um, uh, probably has an ischemic cardiomyopathy given his um, previous scar from cabbage. So the markers of advanced heart failure that in order to try and identify the guy that doesn't look as bad so that he has more options for therapy include this um, uh, uh, mnemonic, I need help. So the I stands for inotropes. Have they ever required an inotrope during hospitalization or are they continually um, uh, having a drip in the outpatient setting? The N stands for their New York Heart Functional Class in which they are three or four, so mild um, activity with moderate symptoms or resting symptoms, or they have a very high NT pro BMP or BMP level, not just a slightly one, but one that could be for like BMP is in the 2000, 3000 or plus. E for end organ dysfunction, meaning that they've got possibly um, renal failure, cardiorenal syndrome, liver function, abnormalities, and we're seeing these gradually develop on their labs. Ejection fraction being in the 20 to 25 percent range. Um, they could start getting defibrillator shocks. They were previously um, not having any kind of ventricular arrhythmias, and on device interrogation, sometimes we will see um, frequent non-sustained VT and maybe not shocks, and this is an indication that arrhythmias are indicating advanced heart failure progression. The H is for hospitalizations, just like I indicated at the beginning of the talk, greater than one hospitalization for heart failure in 12 months indicates high mortality. So um, watching for this and being um, uh, aware if a patient is starting to demonstrate this kind of picture. Another E for edema or escalating diuretics, meaning they have ascites, they have a lot of lower extremity edema, they um, can't, um, you can't seem to improve their volume status well, they might have a lot of diuretic resistance, they're requiring metolazone, they're requiring higher and higher doses of the diuretic. Low blood pressure is developing. A lot of times we see systolic blood pressures in the 90s, and this is a poor prognostics for the P for prognostic medication because we're not able to up titrate their um, guideline directed medical therapy. Maybe we even have to reduce it. So all of that is index indices that this is not just symptomatic heart failure we need to optimize. These are showing more 
um, markers for advanced heart failure. So when we come back to this diagram, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find right at the beginning the patient that's showing these markers and not identifying them where they're on the slippery slope at the end. And the reason being the therapies for advanced heart failure include surgical therapies. So that's heart transplant, which is very limited to become a, um, a candidate. And then there's mechanical circulatory support, which is either temporary or long term that we call left ventricular assist device that patients can um, live with. The non-surgical therapies are palliative inotropes or hospice. <clears throat> so I think I'm finishing a little late, but I'm willing to take any kind of questions you have. Dr. Dr. Britson, there, there is one uh, question in the chat from Dr. John Rao. Um, says, Cardiomem seems like it's indicated in a lot of patients. Are you putting a ton of these in? Is this info in EPIC? So um, we are implanting these devices. Um, the um, when you're saying is this info in Epic? What we I'm assuming you're wanting to know how do you get it um, implanted? So um, we need to actually evaluate and see the patient. So it would be a consult to myself because I'm implanting them, <laughs> and um, and it's to make sure that the patient will be compliant. And the reason I say that we have. Um, uh, have had some patients where we've implanted the device, but they won't lay on the pillow. And if they won't lay on the pillow, we can't see the numbers. And you can't, the, the device itself, as far as monitoring their pressures, um, doesn't treat their heart failure. It's us reacting to their, um, their pulmonary artery pressures. So um, we want to make sure that this is something that they um, uh, are willing to have done and be compliant with. So I would just um, indicate a consult um, for cardiomems would be the indication um, to IHP. I guess I'm a little bit curious on the workflow for you guys on that. Uh, I mean, are you reviewing these like every day on every patient? Uh, so we have nurse practitioners um, that um, will review them and they're sort of assigned. So it's easy when we get it because the, um, the software tells us who is going above. We set thresholds where we want the patient to be. And, um, and we will get alerts if they um, exceed that threshold. If they're staying within their thresholds, we don't have to watch them as much. Um, well, obviously we don't have to worry because they're doing fine, um, but we are able to um, react and adjust uh, stuff um, and um, and make the appropriate changes to um, maintain them. I can tell you that a lot of the patients that um, we have done, we have been able to keep them out of the hospital. Unfortunately, the ones that will not lay on the pillow, um, we can't do anything for them. <laughs> Got you. Thanks. Great presentation, by the way. Thank you. So if there's anyone who had a, a question um, and didn't want to ask it tonight or you have a question that comes up, feel free to put something in the chat and we can get back to um, that question to Dr. Britson. So we're happy that all of you joined us for this heart failure talk and uh, the evaluation link is in the chat. We will also post the presentation in the chat and so you can get it from there. So uh, thank you, Dr. Britson, excellent presentation. Um, we really learned a lot tonight and uh, thank you so much for doing it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Dawn, it's Amy.